In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray in the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, greetings to all in the Western world, Eastern world. I'm in the Western part. And here it is five in the morning on the Eastern Standard Time Zone. And I would like to continue the lessons we began last week on the gift of living in God's divine will. Now to recap a little bit, last week we spoke of how the gift that the Holy Spirit is outpouring in these end times is predicated upon the human propensity to trans-temporally impact all things of all time, which human nature cannot do. That's a reminder for me to wake up. All right. And it's also predicated upon the human intellect's ability to see God in all things. And as Augustine and Francis and St. Paul and St. Magdalene remind us, even sin. And this is because, as St. Paul says, all things work for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose, who love him. So if we love God, God can convert all things, even sin, according to the great saints who had great conversions, to the betterment of not just us, our souls, but also all creation. And this is because of God's one eternal operation that does both. It enables us to transtemporally impact all things, and it also enables us to put all of our trust in God, that with God nothing is impossible. And I think this is part of the reason why when the Blessed Lord appeared to Faustina Kowalska, he had her inscribe under that image after the manner by which he appeared to her, Jesus, I trust in you. So trust is key. Trust is very important in order for us to live in God's divine will. I want to make sure that I'm connected. Um, I have no way of knowing this. Um, Everything is good, Father, loud and clear. Very good, thank you. So without any further ado, if we go to the schedule that was sent out to everybody, we will see that the introductory remarks address Louisa's writings. Now, this is a class on the theology of the gift of living in the divine will. And theology shouldn't intimidate any one of us because it doesn't have anything to do with anything but the study of God. And that study does not mean pure intellectual, academic, analytic, systematical approaches. It also, and above all, means love. Remember, God is love. And in order to understand love, one has to be taught to love. So it's a study on the caritas divina, the divine charity, which is um, caritas divinis, yes. And Louisa would call it carita divino. So let us begin 
with a brief overview of the life and the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Going first and foremost to that date of February 28, 1899, because most of you are familiar with Luisa's biography, her adolescence, her, which we covered also a couple of weeks ago, her early years where she was at from the age of four to 11, experiencing on a daily basis, both good and bad visitations during her sleep from the Blessed Virgin Mary, as well as the devil. And then at the age of 11, she took the name of Mary Magdalene, took the name of Magdalene at the sodality of her church. And then the dreams that nightmares of the evil one stopped and at the age of 13, had the vision of Jesus from her balcony where her mission began of victimhood, where she, not against her will, offered up herself to God's divine fiat for the salvation of souls, the conversion of others, and for the betterment of all creation. And Jesus would educate her throughout her life, up until the day she died, how to do all three offer up herself for the salvation conversion of souls as well as the betterment of creation. And that was principally through her prevenient act, her morning offering, which she said every morning, in which she fused herself in God's divine will Two, through meditating on the passion of our Lord. Three, through her divine acts throughout the day. And that is uniting her intention in everything she did throughout the day with the intention of Christ as exemplified through Mary. So Mary would teach her too how to live in God's divine will and would make her life offering in this way. And four, through her rounds throughout creation, which she would do daily by locating her soul with love in and through creation to requite the love God put in it for her. And on February 28th, 1899, Louisa was placed in obedience to begin to write. So she was asked to follow the counsel of Father Cosimo Loyedice, who was summoned to Louisa's bedside because remember, she had previously experienced Jesus carrying the cross at the age of 13. And now we are here in 1899. She's 24 years old now. And upon having made the sign of the cross over Louisa's body, Father Loya Dice realized that her normal faculties were instantly restored. So he was the first one to call her soul back to her body. Now, her soul was always in her body because otherwise, if it wasn't, she would not be alive. But her soul was in her body just maintaining her vital functions, her breath, her heartbeat. But her senses, Jesus possessed in those moments and assimilated them with his so that she experienced what he experienced. And after Father Loyodice assisted her in this way, <clears throat> certain diocesan priests were called in who around the three o'clock hour, same hour of mercy as Jesus revealed to Faustina in which the floodgates of God's love and mercy are poured out upon the world, restored Louisa to her normal state with the sign of the cross. And they learn how to do this from Father Cosimo Loyadice. And Louisa remained confined to bed for 64 years until her death. And she remained obedient to the counsel of the priests appointed to her by the various archbishops of her diocese that she lived through. This is very important because in these end times in which we live, there is a lot of disobedience on the part of Catholics toward the Pope and toward those united with him. 
Louisa was a, an example, 180 degrees opposed to this attitude. So if we are to live in God's divine will, we have to first and foremost, as Jesus exhorted Louisa to do, trample asunder our will. Our human will should be crushed asunder our feet and submissive to God's divine will. This is not easy because it requires the killing of the human ego. Let me give you a practical example. Let's take a person who doesn't agree with Pope Francis. It's a very practical example because Louisa was always obedient to her ecclesiastical authorities, not just the Pope, but those bishops in union with him, not those not in union with him. This is important, okay? Because Louisa was trained by Jesus and Mary on how to subject her own interests and intentions to those of them, of them both. Mary gave her lessons in the first, for example, eight days for the month of May on how to crush her human will. Mary had Louisa observe her own example. So Mary had Louisa experience Mary's attitude toward the Trinity in the womb of Anne. And Mary had to pass a test of loyalty to God's will. And that test required Mary never conceding one moment and not one breath to her own will. So back to that practical example with the Pope. Take an individual, or rather take these individuals that are easily accessible today online, that create their own websites and blogs, and that use these means of social communication to belittle or undermine the Pope's authority. And there's no shortage of Catholics creating circular emails of links of these websites that do a lot of harm to the heart of Christ and the heart of Mary. And let us suppose that God's extending his divine will to these individuals that are hurting the heart of Christ and Mary by assuming an attitude at variance with that of Christ, Mary, and Louisa with respect to um, obedience to the will of God in and through papal authority and those united with the Pope. If God appeals to them to live in his will and they do not let go of their own will but insist that they know better than those whom God has placed above them, they reject this great and precious gift of God. That attitude alone is enough not to live in God's divine will. I remember Father Joseph Bucci, Giuseppe Bernardino Bucci, before he passed away, who had, by the way, shown, showed to me many of Louisa's relics in his room that he had. And by the way, I have a first class relic of Louisa. It's her hair that was taken from her body when she was exhumed from the earth. And he would tell people, and you can find this on his talk online, that those divine will groups that do not look to the ordained to guide them, that do not have priests to guide them, these are his words, not mine. These groups are diabolical. Now, he explains why they're diabolical. And the explanation to summarize is basically that these groups do not seek to follow the will of God, but the way they want God's will to guide them. So basically, they're following the human will. And Mary tells Louise in the month of May that the human will in and of itself is in constant, always vacillating, and inclined to evil. So left to itself, the human will always ends up doing evil. And in that sense, I think Father Bucci intended that word diabolical. So Louisa, in obedience 
began to write, imagine if Louisa had the attitude of those who refuse to obey those placed above them. And let's suppose Louisa read these blogger websites today and believed them and said, I don't believe the Pope. She would never have begun to write one word of these divine revelations. Why? Because they were done only out of obedience to ecclesial authority. The entire revelation of the divine will is posited, predicated, grounded upon obedience to ecclesial authority. So for someone to say, I want to live in the divine will, but I don't know, I don't follow the Pope's or authority, it's a contradiction. Okay, having finished that point. Obedience is not a heteronomy. And this is made manifest in several church documents. What is a heteronomy? A military obedience. Um, so suppose a general or a colonel sergeant puts one of the soldiers in command and that soldier commands others under him to obey blindly. Okay. Now, this is not the obedience Louisa exemplified, nor that which Christ or Mary exemplified. Pope John Paul II, in his, his um, magisterial document, Consecrated Life, stated that obedience is not blind. Christian obedience is not a blind obedience. It is an informed obedience. This is found also in Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council document. So basically, obedience is following the dictates of one's conscience as formed, that's the key, as formed by the church. So we allow the church's teachings to form our conscience. Okay. Which you I just unplugged the furnace here so it won't turn on and create any background noise. Take, for example, the Blessed Virgin Mary at the moment of the Annunciation. She was asked by the angel Gabriel to become the mother of God. And Mary could not understand how this was possible. Unlike Zechariah, to whom the same angel appeared earlier, telling him that his wife, despite her advanced age, would conceive and laughed at the angel and on account of that was struck dumb, Mary questioned with filial trust. How is this possible? As I do not know, ma'am. So her question was not mocking God like that of Zechariah. It was not the attitude like that of that Zechariah. But it was an, an attitude that she assumed of wanting her human intellect and her will to work in sync. Blind obedience does not allow the intellect and the human will to work in sync. Blind obedience engages only the will while the intellect is completely ignorant. This is not Christian obedience. That's blind obedience. And the church does not advocate blind obedience. Christian obedience is when the will seeks to obey while allowing the grace of God to inform its intellect. Now, this does not mean that everything that you may be commanded by the church concerning its moral and faith teachings, you, you understand completely. It doesn't mean you completely understand it, but it means that you do understand to some degree the rationale behind this teaching while allowing God's grace through time and through ongoing reflection, counsel, as Mary did, pondering it in your heart, like when Jesus was found in the temple, they didn't understand why he did that. But they accepted it, and they pondered on it, she and Joseph, until it finally made more and more sense. 
And they realized that those three days of him missing were a prelude of the three days he would again be missing in the tomb before his resurrection. But they didn't get it right away. But they obeyed, knowing that faith and reflection and pondering and counsel, which Mary also received, as well as Joseph, would lead to a more more exponential, gradual understanding of this truth. That is the attitude Mary had. And that's not the attitude Zechariah had. And that's not the attitude these people have that openly undermine the authority of the Pope. And one of the presumptions of those who do so is that they assume that they either are to be given full knowledge of anything that the church teaches or they can reject it. And this is presumption. Take, for example, the church's teaching on the ABCs, artificial birth control, that came out with Humani Vitae under Pope Paul VI's pontificate. Many people did not agree with it. And to this day, many Catholics don't exemplify it. They don't follow it. Okay, this is where the divine will begins, when the rubber meets the road in action, not just in theory. And Louisa was trained in practice. Whenever she would do something that was opposed to the will of God in her early years. Jesus would stop her right in her tracks and correct her so that she wouldn't go on with any misunderstandings of his divine will. So her writings are the fruit of this obedience. And this is the kind of obedience that keeps us free. See, God doesn't force us against our will to do his will, never does. He encourages us, but he leaves us free to say yes or no. If he didn't, there would be no merit. Because merit is based upon a free will offering, which Mary gave, which Louisa gave. A life offering that's freely done. And St. James talks about this in, the, in his letter in the scriptures. He says, Christ has given us a law of freedom, not a law of slavery. The devil forces you to do what he wants. That's called demonic possession. God never does that. His possession never violates the free human will, intellect, or memory. The devil cannot possess your will, but he can possess your intellect and memory. And if a person is steeped in sin and dabbling in the occult and exposing themselves to esotericism and things like that, So on February 28, 1899, Louisa begins really her public journey. Up until now, it's been private. Up until she began to write in obedience, her journey was private. Only people around her little town with whom she shared these prophetic revelations knew it. And she didn't want it to be shared until Father Cosimo Loyedice asked her to, and she obeyed. And priests would come around the three o'clock hour following Father Loyedice's example by making the sign of the cross either on her forehead or on, the, on her hand, and her soul, the senses, would come back to her and restore to Louisa her normal state. And it is noteworthy that Louisa remained confined to bed, as I mentioned, for about 64 years until her death and always remained obedient to the counsels of whatever priests were appointed to her. Imagine if Louisa said, I don't like this priest, I want that one, or I want this one. She never did that. She accepted whatever priest was given to her by her bishop. And you know what? God used whatever priest that was appointed to her by her bishop to guide her and her writings. What does that tell you? And it doesn't matter who occupies the office, but whom the authorities of the church choose. And there is a teaching here in the church that I wish to share with you called ex opere operato, which means from the work wrought. 
referring, for example, to the sacraments of confession and communion. Whenever a priest consecrates the body and blood of Christ or absolves of sin, it's always valid. Christ always works through the priest, even if the priest is in a state of mortal sin. Let me repeat that. This is a doctrine of the church, ex opere operato. Even if the priest does not meet the standards of virtue expected of him by God or the church, and let's take an extreme example, he's committed several murders, he belongs to the mob or something like that, and he's now not confessed and has no contrition, nor does he seek to be forgiven, but intends to absolve in that sinful state and intends to consecrate, the consecration still happens and is valid. The absolution still happens and is valid, which is a parallel teaching that it doesn't matter who the priest is but that he is appointed by God through the church authority, okay? So at the age of 18, Louisa became a third order Dominican and taking the name of Magdalene, as I mentioned, in the presence of her pastor, she started to experience the freedom of these nightmares that previously had plagued her. And she continued to suffer after this vision she had at the age of 13 where she was unable to eat for three days. And then this state um, digressed to the point where she could not can maintain anything in her stomach. It would regurgitate intact and digress even more to the point where she could no longer walk. And God would reveal to her later in life that there's reason for this. He wanted her to live literally only on the divine will. So after Louisa continued to suffer, um, she was sometimes left from around 11 p.m. to midnight till around 7 in the morning in a state of rigidity. And her condition finally came to the attention of her archbishop, who at the time was Giuseppe Joseph Dottola, who in 1884 appointed Father Michael de Benedictis as her confessor. So Louisa goes from Father Loyadice who is appointed to her by her bishop, to another priest, Father Michael de Benedictis. And the reason for this change is because even in Louisa's days as today, priests are moved from parish to parish. So when one priest would leave to take up another assignment and couldn't be close to Louisa to counsel her, remember that back then there was no internet, there was no tele <laughs> telephones like we have today. Um, so... If they couldn't physically see her, they couldn't counsel her. So another priest took the other priest's place. So <clears throat> Father Michele, Michael de Benedictis, was her confessor. And Father de Benedictis visited Louisa daily, every day. And she, in turn, revealed her soul like an open book to him, as Jesus asked her to. Initially, Louisa was, because of her shy and timid nature, hesitant in revealing all of her sins to the priest. Remember, Jesus assured Louisa that she never committed one mortal sin throughout her entire life. But even the venial sins God wanted her to reveal to her priest because of her special mission. And Jesus said, hold nothing back. But she did sometimes. And this frustrated Jesus, grieved him. Till finally she understood that she must reveal everything to every priest that she has been appointed to or under. And she submitted herself to Father Michael de Benedictis in obedience, while he imposed restrictions on her sufferings. That is, whether she could accept as a victim soul this or that penance that she would self-impose. If you go to her museum in Corato, you will see the instruments of suffering and penance that she self-imposed. Some people ask me, well, she had the stigmata. Wasn't that enough suffering? <laughs> and I would say absolutely it was enough. 
But she loved God so much and saw how much of what the loss of one soul grieved him and how much glory that would take away from creation and how many lost divine acts that soul would forever deprive creation of. That she went beyond what was expected of her. Sometimes to the point of harming herself physically. And this is where her obedience to her authority, church authority um, was used, availed by God for her own good. So she would not take upon herself any sufferings that were not permitted of her, that were not given to her directly by Christ, by following the authority of those whom the church had placed over her. And it was during this time that Louisa received permission to remain continuously in bed and to abstain from eating, except for one small meal a day, which she always regurgitated, whole and intact. And she would remain in the state, in bed, of victimhood, living on the Eucharist, on the divine will for the rest of her life, nearly 60 years in all. And although she would remain confined to bed and under the counsel of several confessors appointed by church authority, most of whom she outlived, she never suffered any physical illness, bed sores, except for the pneumonia that took her life in 1917. And some people found sometimes when she would go from the night with Jesus in a mystical state, to the moment when the priest would call her back to her body, her soul back to her body, at least it senses, that her socks were partially worn, as if she were walking all night, which she was doing in the spirit, but it manifested itself even in the material order. And these are miracles of God that we can't fully comprehend, much like weeping statues or exuding blood or exuding oil. Science can't explain this. We can't explain this. But sometimes the spiritual overflows onto the material as was the case with Louisa. And after Father Michael, the priest who, who had assisted Louisa, um, she had other confessors. Okay. And then Father Cosimo Loyadice um, resumed guidance of Louisa again. He became her confessor in 1887. He was called back to his monastery. And um, we find that uh, in Louisa's first volume, she relates how Jesus allowed her to undergo sufferings for the salvation of souls according to various events in human history that she experienced. For example, the cholera epidemic, the First World War, the Second World War, and the list goes on. And in answer to her prayers that were accompanied by sufferings, Louisa was once again placed under the spiritual guidance of another priest, and then another priest, and then another priest, leading up to Father Benedict, um, Father St. Hannibal di Francia, who would begin to publish her writings. He was the first priest who exposed to the public these beautiful writings. And after her, Father Benedict Calvi did the same. And for this reason, Jesus calls Saint Hannibal the first apostle of the divine will. An apostle is one who preaches to the public the good news. And that's what Hannibal did. He was the first to release to the public, after having reviewed her writings, the first 19 volumes, the hours of the Passion, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will Book or Christmas Novena, which he appended to the first 19 volumes, the beginning of them, he appended them to, appended it to the Novena, and he would exchange letters of correspondence with her, and he also asked her to write several prayers, St. Hannibal did, like the Consecration and the Divine Will. He asked her also to add to the month of May, six additional meditations. So what was initially 31 became 36, corresponding to the 36 volumes of Jesus, 12 times 3. 
And um, a few years later, in 1894, the Archbishop of Trani, Domenico Maringelli, appointed Father Dei Benedictis, her official confessor. Now let's get to the writings. Um, Louisa, she penned quite a few writings, over 15,000 pages in all. And if you wish to wrap your head around how voluminous this is, consider the Bible, cover to cover, Old and New Testament combined. That is just under 2,000 pages. Multiply that by about five. That's how much Louisa wrote. That's quite a bit. And um, Louisa began writing, not volume one, but volume two. Later on, she was asked by her, again, spiritual guide, priest, to write volume one, which she did, which is her infant years. And her writings began on February 28th, 1899, and ended on December 18th, 1938. And they include her 36 volumes, which are popularly known as the Her Diary, Il Diario, manuscripts, in separate notebooks. And then she wrote the Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, the Rounds of the Soul in the Divine Will, known as the Pious Pilgrimage of the Soul in Creation, in the Divine Will, actually. Il Giro dell'Anima nella Divina Volontà. Her Notebook of Childhood Memories. Quaderno di Memoria dell'Infanzia. Her Christmas Novena, La Novena di Natale. And her letters. And Father Loyadice, who commanded her to write, died on March 10th, 1922. And he was succeeded by, as I mentioned, several different priests. And having begun a series of visits, an intimate colloquy with Louise in 1910 that lasted for 17 years until her death, St. Hannibal Maria di Francia became her sensu liberorum of three dioceses of Trani. And um, these dioceses were Trani, Barletta, and Bicelle, okay, which now are all included under the, the now archdiocese of Trani. And he also became her confessor as well. And he appended to her, <coughs> excuse me, first 19 volumes, his Nihil Upstadt, and her bishop, Joseph Leo, appended to them his imprimatur. He produced, St. Hannibal di Francia produced four editions of the Hours of the Passion. And they are not all the same. And people ask, why is that? Why is every edition of the Hours of the Passion different? If these hours are so precious and they save the places where they are read and the people who read them from chastisements, at least in part, as Jesus assures Louisa, how come they change? Well, it's because they are subject to ecclesial authority. And Hannibal, who published the first four editions in Italian, the only four editions in Italian, the fifth came out in German by Ludwig Beta. That was a translation from the Italian into German. Um, were um, expanded on at the request of Hannibal, Hannibal. So, for example, if Louisa wrote something about one of the hours, let's take, for example, Jesus in prison in the early hours of the morning waiting to be judged by the court, the kangaroo court, which was illegal. They were not allowed to convene at night, but they did it anyway. They broke their own mosaic law rules just to condemn Christ to death. A dishonest court, dishonest high priest, dishonest church. Now, this is not the sacramental church we have today, of course, which Jesus assured us is always guided. And when the gates of hell will never prevail against it, always guided by the papacy. On this rock, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But this was a kangaroo court with dishonest Pharisees and scribes. They were not all dishonest. Remember, there was Joseph of Arimathea, there was Nicodemus and others. Some were good. And they defended our Lord. But if Hannibal, after having read what Louisa wrote on Jesus imprisoned, 
awaiting his trial. Desired for her to elaborate on a certain aspect of that meditation, he would ask her and she would do it. Hence, the difference of the four different editions. At the request of Hannibal, she would add more. The same thing explains why the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will for the month of May, which can be read in any month, but particularly for May, was expanded upon as well, again at the request of St. Hannibal. Louisa was dictated um, by Mary these writings. To Louisa was dictated by Mary these writings. And Mary revealed to Louisa in 31 days her entire life. And Hannibal asked Louisa to expand upon, not the day, not add any days to them, but to expand upon the existing days that Mary revealed to her, and she did. And that is why we have an additional six months uh, five meditations at the end, totaling 36 in all. They are not additional days. They are additional meditations for existing days, expanded meditations. Same thing with the four different editions of the Hours of the Passion. All right. And um, St. Hannibal went on to his eternal reward on June 1st, 1927, without... And this is a beautiful detail that we overlook oftentimes. Finishing the work God commissioned him to do. St. Hannibal wanted deeply and earnestly, and in fact, he pled and begged Louisa to pray to God for him to finish all 36 volumes. And Louisa prayed and implored God. But God said no. Sound familiar? St. Paul, he pleaded with God to remove what's in Greek called the skolop, which is a thorn in the side, in the flesh. But God said, no, I will not remove this because my grace is sufficient in weakness. My grace is perfect, my power is perfected in weakness. So God did not allow St. Hannibal to finish the 36 volumes. What does this tell us, this beautiful detail? It's a very wise lesson in life here and that we should commit to memory. And I'm going to use, if I can pull this up on the fly, a lesson from St. Faustina Kowalska to give you the reason why God did not allow Hannibal to finish this 36 volumes. It has to do with intention. Okay? This comes from Entry 822 of St. Faustina Kowalska's diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul. She states, I have come to understand today. Now, how old is she now? She was born in 1905. She's still young, right? Eight. I have come to understand today that even if I did not accomplish any of the things the Lord is demanding of me, I know that I shall be rewarded as if I had fulfilled everything. Because the Lord sees the intention with which I begin to work. And even if he called me to himself today, the work would not suffer at all by that. Because God himself is both the Lord of the work and the worker. My part is to love him to folly all works are nothing, all works are nothing more than a tiny drop before God. It is love that has meaning, power, and merit. So, Hannibal wanted, earnestly, and pleaded with God and Louisa to spare his life to, until he finished the 36 volumes and God received his intention and rewarded him as if he finished all 36. You see? But at the same time, <coughs> God wanted others to participate and derive merit from the work Hannibal was doing. How generous is that of God? Not only did he give Hannibal all the merit as if he finished all 36, published them all, but he wants to give the merit to others as well. And this would not be possible 
if God allowed Hannibal to finish everything. The same thing applies to us. All right. <clears throat> and then another work was published by Father Benedict Calvi after St. Hannibal went on to his eternal reward. <clears throat> Father Benedict Calvi, Louisa's confessor, published a work that's not known to many in the English-speaking world called Nel Regno della Divina Volontà, and then in parentheses, Prima parte storia di un'anima, close parentheses, Alba che sorge, which is in English, in the kingdom of the divine will, in parentheses, first part, the story of a soul, close parentheses, the rising dawn, unquote. And this work published by Father Benedict Calvi was given the imprimatur by, again, Archbishop Joseph Leo. <clears throat> and Father Calvi published a third edition of this book. He published it in three editions. And uh, I'm sorry, he published a third edition of the book, The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, also bearing the imprimatur of 1932, with subsequent editions in 1933 and 1937. Okay, and um, this book uh, also was different than the original publication of Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. Again, because Father Benedict Calvi asked Louisa to expand upon it as well. So you see, what is God telling us here so far through Louisa's writings? That even though these writings contain the fulfillment of the Our Father prayer and will bring about the reign of God's will on earth as in heaven, even these are subject to those whom God puts in authority in the church. And as in the case of the publishing of the summary of the first four volumes of Louisa, which Father Benedict Calvi did. Um, <clears throat> among which were notes that he added to them. He um, chose to publish these in Italian and disseminate them like St. Hannibal. And the third edition of this Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will that Father Hannah Benedict Calvi published had different appendices, among which was one containing about 20 chapters from Louisa's last volumes entitled Prodigi d'amore che la Divina Volontà operò Nella Regina della Cella, which is in English, loving prodigies that the divine will wrought within the Queen of Heaven. Again, many American or English or Australian or Irish or English speaking people don't know these works because they were not translated into English. And this appendix was published separately from um, the uh, these third volume. Okay. Um, So, with that in mind, let's conclude this session here by stating that the life and writings of the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, exemplify how we are to live in the divine will. And that exemplification is founded upon the law of freedom. God is not a taskmaster, as is Satan. He doesn't force our free human will. He gently invites us to follow his divine will by submitting our thoughts, our judgments, our desires to those of his son, Jesus Christ, and our and Jesus Christ's mother, Mary. We do this by, number one, establishing a steadfast daily prayer life. Without prayer, 
there can be no listening to the voice of God. Prayer attunes our ears to the voice of the shepherd. Those who don't pray eventually fall into sin because they can't hear God's voice. Prayer <coughs> enables us to tune our ears to the voice of the shepherd and discern his voice. With a steadfast daily prayer life, we must also follow the dictates of our conscience and allow our conscience to be formed by the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Remember, Jesus gave us the guarantee that the church will never be led astray, never. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. <clears throat> Number three, in addition to prayer and the law of freedom, that is, an obedience that we freely welcome so that the intellect can work in sync with the will and doing the will of God, we must um, do our act divine acts that include number one the morning offering in the divine will or no or in latin known as the prevenient act two we renew that act throughout the day known as the actual act in italian atto attuale meaning everything you do throughout the day must be accompanied by a pure intention what is that pure intention what did St. Faustina say in that entry 822? If your intention is to do the will of God and you go out of your way to form your conscience according to the church's teachings, even if you do something wrong, God will still be pleased. She says that in two entries. She says that in 822, which I shared with you, but she says it also in entry 800. This is what she says in 800. If one does not know what is better to do, one must reflect, consider, and seek advice. That seek advice is following the church because one must not act with an uncertain conscience. When you are uncertain, say to yourself, whatever I do will be good. I have the intention of doing good, but the intention is formed actually by the church. The Lord God accepts what we consider good and the Lord God also accepts and considers it as good. One should not worry if after some time one sees that Whatever one does is not good. God looks at the intention with which we begin and will reward us accordingly. This is a principle we ought to follow, period. And again, that comes right out of St. Faustina's diary, entry 800. The other one was entry 822. So if we do our morning offering, renew that throughout the day with an upright intention in everything we do, which is the actual act. If we do our rounds throughout the day by requiting the love God put in creation for us, for love of God through creation, transcending all time, thanking God for all things of the past, present, future, which are the rounds. And if we meditate on the hour, on the passion of our Lord daily, the hours of the passion, those four acts throughout the day, accompanied by the preceding two I mentioned, steadfast daily prayer life, and law of freedom and obedience, then we are living in the divine will. And we could be sure that we don't leave it. Okay, let us conclude with a little prayer and a final blessing. In the future, <clears throat> um, we will be posting, well, we are posting already these talks. And there's a link on that mail out, that PDF mail out we sent, where you can see these recorded talks. This in the future will be posted as well on that same link. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, third fiat of sanctification. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the gift of living in the divine will. Send forth your spirit, bring it forth out of us, the spirit we received at baptism, that we received an increase of that confirmation, so that we may receive his fullness with the new outpouring of the gift every day of God's divine will. Come renew the face of the earth through our fiat. Amen. And may God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>